This is This Week in Science and Education, Episode 31, recorded Tuesday, March 22, 2011. It's time for This Week in Science and Education, the show that talks about academic discovery and science and research and how to take that information and bring it into today's classroom. On today's show, David Pearson and friends talk about communicating science through mass media. All that today and more on This Week in Science and Education. This Week in Science and Education is brought to you by Sheridan Institute of Technology and Advanced Learning. At Sheridan Institute, students shine brighter. Check out SheridanShineBrighter.com. Hey, everybody. It's time for This Week in Science and Education. This is your regular host, Kevin Kugler, broadcaster from the University of Western Ontario. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. We have a very exciting show. We're welcoming from Laurentian University Dr. David Pearson and his um, panel of students. We're going to talk about some very interesting things. But before we get to them, I do want to welcome, as usual, my co-hosts, Colin Jago from the Quartha Pine Ridge District School Board and Thomas Merritt from Laurentian. Hey, guys. How is it going? Hey. Good, Kev. How are you? Good. Ah, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's uh, it's a, it's an interesting day. We've got uh, somebody who's with us today that's going to throw some eggs at us. They've got some props. Uh, <laughs> it's not just, uh, our listening audience, uh, you know, speaking to to us anymore. So um, I think this is going to be very interesting for them. So let's get to our guests now and introduce them. Um, Dr. David Pearson from Laurentian University. Um, Dr. Pearson was on leave from Laurentian as the project director for Science North from 1980 to 1986, or 1996, no, 1986, sorry, and remains the associate director uh, participating in special projects. He's hosted two television series, Understanding the Earth for TV Ontario and Down to Earth for Mid-Canada Television, as well as a weekly radio spot called Radio Lab, and that's found on CBC Northern Ontario Radio. He's an invited member of the Osprey Writers Group. He received the Ward Neal Medal from the Geological Association of Canada for promotion of the Earth Sciences in Canada in 2001, and the McNeil Medal for Science Communication from the Royal Society of Canada in 2003. Um, Dr. Pearson, thank you very much for joining us here today. We're very excited to have you. Perhaps you could tell us a little more about who you are, what you do, and introduce these, uh, these students sitting next to you. Well, thanks so much, Kevin, um, for that uh, for that introduction. Uh, I'm uh, a partly a, a science communicator, which is what I learned to do when I, I ran the two television series and did those uh, those radio spots. I'm also, though, by background, a, a geologist, and part of what I want to talk to you today about is um, is some of the the geology around Sudbury to put that into the sort of science story that we tell when we're talking about what researchers do up here, both in the university and in the the uh, the mining companies. Uh, but first what I want to do is to introduce the, the two students who are, are with me. They're very special students, not just because they happen to be nice people, but also they're two <laughs> students in the only graduate program in science communication in, in North America. There are 13 others, uh, and they're all here at Laurentian because ours is the only graduate program in, in science communication on the, uh, on the continent. And part of what they will do is sort of exemplify the kind of things that, um, that graduate students in science communication do. And for those who are watching, a uh, graduate student means that they already have science degrees. And uh, Steph, why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are and what degree you have. And then Josh, you can follow along after Steph, please. All right. Hi, I'm Steph. And I went to the University of Guelph, where I studied wildlife biology. So that's sort of my passion is animals and conservation. And Josh? Uh, I'm Josh. Uh, I did my undergrad here at Laurentian University. And I did a combined degree in biomedical biology and in psychology. And part of what's interesting about Josh, if I can just add to that, is that Josh has also worked at, at Science North and so has some experience in doing the kinds of things that lead us to have some eggs on the table and some other stuff tucked, um, tucked behind us here that we're going to bring out to, to demonstrate to you how to catch people's attention when you're, you're telling science stories. And these guys have the pleasure of doing this sort of stuff in their classes um, and, and not just, uh, not just at, at Science North and at home in the kitchen for parents and, and, and 
so forth. <laughs> now, part of what we, um, we always stress is that the best stories come from people who actually are speaking about what they've, what they've experienced. So if, uh, if you've been there and you've done it, then you can talk about the science that's involved. You can, you can make yourself or you can be much more convincing than if what you're doing is you're talking from what you've learned out of a, out of a textbook. And, and part of what's interesting about uh, Steph is that um, she was late for, for the course, late for, um, for, the, for the first classes of our science communication program, but she was late for a, a really terrific reason, which gives her um, a leg up when it comes to talking about climate change in Canada. Steph. So it's not just a, fa it's not just a matter of hitting the snooze button too many times, eh, Steph? Not this time, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so what I did, it was really exciting. My parents took me on what they call an educational cruise, and it was with um, Adventure Canada. And so what it was is we went on this ship, and there were lecturers aboard who told us there was a marine biologist, there was a historian, a geologist, um, an Inuit interpreter, so just a bunch of people that knew you know, everything about the Arctic. And so I have some slides to show of some pictures that I took. I was lucky enough to take when I was there. And this was the first impression I got of the Arctic here. And honestly, my first thought was, what is that? And it's part of the Greenlandic ice cap, which I thought was so impressive to see from the sky. So you are looking down from the plane here, Steph? Yeah, this is out the plane window. This is me anticipating my Arctic trip, getting excited, looking out the window. And this was a, a special part of the Arctic. You were heading up to the Northwest Passage, to the fabled Northwest Passage that... Um, who's that guy from Nova Scotia who sings about the Northwest Passage? Stan Rogers. 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 Stan Rogers. His Stan son, Rogers, of course. Yeah, his son was actually aboard as the musical guest. You're kidding. No, so we yes. sang that song a few well, times. Well, 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 well. <laughs> Up in the Northwest really Passage. Not many yeah. people have, have, have done that. Right. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I'm cutting into your slides. Carry no, on. it's fine. So, yeah, that was the name of the trip was into the Northwest Passage. So we started out in Greenland, which is what you see here. And then I'm just going to move along to icebergs. There was lots of ice, even though it was in the summer. And it was just... There's so much out there, and that there's, but there's no perspective. You can't really tell how big things are until you get right up close to them. So, for example, one day we were heading out into, to see um, the mouth of a glacier, and it took us like four hours, and the whole time we were standing there like, yeah, we're almost there, we're almost there, because you can't tell. You're not passing any buildings, you're not passing any houses, and you can't tell how close you are to things, and it was really impressive. And then this picture will give you a better idea of how big they are, because we actually got to go out on little zodiacs and get right up close to them, and they're like skyscrapers. They're so huge. It's just so impressive. And then there's an example. That's the ship we were on with over 100 people. So it's not a small boat, but from this vantage point, it looks tiny. So it looks like a little island out in the bay there. Is that right? Is that it sitting out there? Yeah, the tiny little speck. <laughs> That's what I lived on for a couple of weeks. But so it just looks, it's just so expansive and it looks, it looks almost barren. But then if you take a closer look, you find little gems like these, like a little pink flower and lichen everywhere, which I was very impressed by because I was told that it takes lichen hundreds of years to establish itself. So the, these rocks essentially were, have not been touched by humans or even animals for hundreds of years for this lichen to establish there. And then, of course, you're looking out along the shore, and all of a sudden, one of the rocks starts moving, and you notice that it's a polar bear, which was super exciting, because <laughs> polar bears are in the news a lot these days, and it was really exciting to see a mom with her two cubs. We actually watched them play in the water for almost an hour before she came out like that. And then we were walk walking along the beach, and there's some wolf tracks that must have been... It, the wolf must have been walking there about an hour before we were, so that was just really cool to imagine. And like I said, on board were professionals and expert people that know all about the Arctic, including Ayu, who is an Inuit woman. And she's also a lawyer, so she told us all about the troubles that the Inuit people go through and all the, just, um, the... Uh, the deprivation, yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. And, but she also told us like all the fun stuff, all their um, inspiring traditions and their love of nature and their respect for the world. And that's some seal meat that she's... Well, she's cutting some seal fur, and then on the other side, there's meat. And she actually convinced me to eat. <laughs> That's me holding a seal eyeball. She convinced me to eat an eyeball, some brain, liver, muscle, and heart of a seal. And yet, it's raw, definitely not cooked. 
And we also got to visit some of the villages along the coast. So this is in Pond Inlet. And it was great talking to these kids. We played soccer with them and they toured us around their town, which was just so much fun. And we all asked each other questions nonstop because it was like this whole new world for both of us, for, for my side and their side. And this is actually, I put it as my last slide because it's a sunset, but it's actually the, one of the first things I saw in the Arctic and it was, it's so beautiful. And uh, just seeing the Arctic was inspiring to see the, how fragile the planet is and how, how untouched the Arctic is and how much it needs preservation. So it was really, it was really great to see all that. And part of what you have to realize, you know, is that um, five years ago it wasn't possible to make a journey like uh, like the one that Steph made and all the people on the on the boat. The Northwest Passage was frozen over 365 days of the of the year, and it just wasn't possible for a ship to get to get through. So being able to to experience what what Steph did is part of of what's happening to the Arctic because of the warming of the of the planet. And those kids that she talked to are in Pond Inlet, for example, are living in communities that will never be the same as they were when the parents of those kids were born. Uh, these are communities that are changing both in, in the availability of the, the food that they're used to eating, the seals that, that Steph was talking about, the food from the land, the caribou. Um, they, they, they live in a, in a, totally, a totally different sort of subsistence way. They don't, uh, they don't just automatically go to, the, go to the supermarket and their way of life is, uh, is, is, is changing. And, and part of what one wants to, to bring out from, from uh, people like Steph who've had the chance for the, of this experience is to be able to speak about that at, um, at, at first hand to, to, other, to other Canadians. It, um, it, it really is extraordinary to be sitting next to somebody who's been able actually to go on a boat through the Northwest Passage. Stan Rogers, when he sang about the Northwest Passage, had never been able to do that. This is the first generation that's been able to go through the, the Northwest Passage. Now, and remarkable Colin pictures also, as well. If I could pardon? just uh, interrupt for one second, I'm sure. just wondering, um, Colin, you were on a ship up there in uh, in, in northern uh, in, in the Arctic as well. You guys weren't on the same ship by any chance, were you? Um, not to my knowledge, no. no. <laughs> there's a number there's a number of crews that went up there. Um, it could be the same ship, I guess. It depends on who the, who they charter. There's a number of companies that do the charters. I was up with a group called Students on Ice uh, two oh, years yes. ago up the, uh, the east coast of Baffin Island with uh, a group of about uh, 40 or 50 um, high school students. So yeah, very similar. Some of your pictures are very similar. Some of your stories are very similar stuff. So I'm sitting here sort of grinning, going, yeah, this is great, sort of reliving what I had done as well. Yeah. That's, uh, that's Jeff Green's group, isn't it? It sure and, is. And, yes, it is. And they're high school students. And they go, they, uh, they go down to the Antarctic as, as well. Yes. Yeah, Jeff is a very enterprising um, uh, young man, and in fact, we talk about him a little bit in our, our class, believe it or not. Um, mm -hmm. Jeff's one of these people who's been able to get where he is by being able to say, yes, I can do that, when yeah. he's only done it once before. And, uh, <laughs> and then we, figuring we try it out to, on the way. That's, well, all those sorts of things. You talk to <laughs> Jeff and you'll find he's got lots of stories like that. And we try to induce sure that kind of self-confidence in our, in our students too. And Jeff, although he doesn't know it, is a, is a bit of a, a role model for, um, for, uh, for us in, in science communication because of his, um, hmm. uh, well, his, his initiative and his, his confidence. Now, part of what we uh, also do, if I may go on and introduce Josh a, a, a little more, is we do Please. emphasize to, to our students that um, science communication is important in many, many different uh, spheres, many, many different areas. It's not just science centers and science museums and working for Pollution Probe or those sorts of organizations who are often in the, the news talking about science, but also in um, places like, like health units. And, and Josh is, is off to, um, to spend uh, two months on what we call his internship. All of the students have to go to a, an organization that's involved with communicating science. And Josh is off to the health unit here in yeah, Sudbury. Can you Sudbury speak Sudbury a little bit unit. more about that, Josh? Uh, well, basically, I'm starting there in a month. And I'm going to have the opportunity to work uh, on a bunch of different projects at the health unit. Uh, they said I'll be helping with uh, school outreach uh, with their website to help redevelop it. And also, uh, I'll have the opportunity to help develop some, some outreach programs. Uh, they're working on an outreach program uh, for asthma education for Aboriginal youth. And so they said I might have a chance to go into schools on uh, Manitoulin Island, close, close by Sudbury, and help to, help to do some research and develop this program. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. It's, it's going to be a, a great learning experience and a lot of fun, I think.
And Steph, where's your internship? I'm going to be at WWF Canada in Toronto, which is super exciting for me because I'm, like I said, big on conservation. So I'm not going to be doing outreach packages so much like Josh, but they said that they want to hear my perspective on the Arctic because they're focusing on that a lot right now. And just writing things for, for not only the Beautiful. public, but for their corporate sponsors and stuff like that. So it should be a lot of fun. So that's the World Wildlife Fund. And I think it's the 50th anniversary of the World Wildlife Fund this, this year. Did they talk a little bit about that, Steph? They didn't, but I think it is. I think, I think, yeah. I think it is. So a great place for, uh, for Steph to be going to spend, um, to spend her internship. Um, if, if I were able to bring the 13 other students into the, into the, the, uh, the studio, you'd find that uh, they're not, not all from, from Ontario. We have a, a student from, from Arizona who is uh, an astronomer, and she's off to Switzerland to do her internship with, uh, with CERN, the organization that has that, wow. what is it, Super Hadron super Collider or something to the sort of thing. Yeah, uh, yeah so she's off there. To, yeah, it, it, it's sort of right at the cutting edge of, of not just doing science, but also of communicating the, uh, the physical sciences. So it's kind of exciting to be able to export our students to, uh, to places like, um, like, like CERN. And we sent one off three or four years ago to the Science Times in Beijing and another one off to, um, to the big science center in, um, in, in, in Copenhagen. So part of what I think uh, is a, a message that I'd like to leave with the students who are, who are watching this, um, this program is that being a, being a specialist in science doesn't mean that you, you, um, you're restricted to working in, in labs, either research labs in university or research labs for, uh, for companies, pharmaceutical companies, for example. There are also careers in, in um, communicating science. And communicating science in places where there's a, a huge public importance Part of, uh, part of what Canada's wrestling with at the moment is, uh, is its climate change policy. Um, what, uh, what kinds of, uh, of, of measures, that might be taxes, they might be, um, they might be restrictions on, uh, on the sale of, uh, of, of some goods that, that are the result of, of manufacturing processes that produce a lot of greenhouse gases. A lot of that sort of, uh, of, of discussion going on, and part of what fuels it and what informs it and makes sure that it's, uh, it's a, a correctly based uh, discussion is the science of, of, uh, of climate change. There's a lot of misinformation out there, as you might have talked about in some of your, your earlier programs, and it's very important that, uh, that people with a science background are part of the discussion process within government that develops those, those policies. And scientists so often say, we'll do the science, we'll provide you with our results, and then other people can, can talk about how best to make, to make use of those results. I don't believe in that, and part of the, one of the themes that we emphasize in our, in our program is that um, it's important to take science into the decision-making uh, to the decision-making tables in, um, in, in any country, but certainly in Canada at the, at the moment. But well, that's part of what we talk about, talk about too. Now, if I can switch entirely to these eggs here, um, to hey, something Hang on, that's... David, before, before we go to the eggs? Sure. Um, I had a question, well, sort of between you and Steph. I mean, the, the idea, Steph, of your unique uh, perspective of being able to go in and talk to students about your experience in the Arctic, um, with the exception of maybe Colin, um, a lot of teachers aren't going to have that opportunity to, to do that kind of trip. So as a teacher, how do you go about handling that? I mean, is, it, is part of the game trying to find people like Steph that have had the experience, or is there a way that they can incorporate other people's experience and bring that into a classroom? So how, how do we get this kind of, of uh, experience and get that out to students when there's so few of you that have actually had that experience? Do you want Steph to have a go at that, or, or, or sure, one of your other awesome. panelists having a, having a go at that? Well, I have, I'm trying to remember what it was called, but one of the professors that was on board with us was uh, Danny Catt from uh, British Columbia Institute of Technology. Is that what it's called? BCIT? Yeah. And he was the photographer and the wildlife uh, ecologist. And he did this thing a few, like a couple months after we got back, and it was sort of like this. It was a podcast and he told his experiences and it was like Canadians just and people all over the world tuned in a lot of kids full classrooms and stuff and 
it was interactive, like they could ask questions, they could type questions or, or mic in if they had a mic. It was really cool and I, I don't know if I can get that information to you guys to put on the website or something, but it yeah. was really cool. So there's things like that, there's options like this and we have technology so it's, it's easier. Otherwise, Please do I don't that know, I can write a Steph. bunch of stories. Yeah, okay, I will for sure. No. Yeah, send it over. Um, and for those of you listening, the uh, the website address to go to access the show notes show notes will be tys twise dot vrock dot ca. We'll put it in the show notes uh, together with some other information about uh, Steph and Josh and uh, Dr. Pearson as well. So check out the show notes there. Let's have some eggs thrown at us. This sounds fun. What do we yeah. got? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, wh wh I just bought these in the, the supermarket um, yesterday evening. So they're, they're absolutely genuine eggs. And, and when we finish with them here, they're, they're going to be part of um, bacon and eggs in the, in the Pearson <laughs> household. Uh, and and they're, uh, one of the ways to catch people's uh, attention always when one's telling science stories is to... Um, to emphasize what seems counterintuitive, what you wouldn't believe um, if you were told it. And, and one of the things about eggs that's, um, that's very important is how difficult they are to crack. Um, and, and people will be saying, well, hey, eggs are easy to crack. Um, you just take your knuckle and you, you do this. Well, if you do that, you can crack them. But try next time you want to crack an egg to, to break it by pressing from end to, to end. And I can tell you, and, and you could, yes, there goes Steph. And Josh, do you want to you see if you can get your fingers on the top there? Oh man, I okay, hope it breaks. We're pushing. <laughs> we're pushing. And we can't crack that, that egg. Eggs are very strong when they're compressed from, from, from end to end. And in fact, the eggshell is slightly flexible. Eggshell is, is made of little columns and, and as we're pressing, those columns are actually deforming slightly and the egg is, is, is swelling a little bit in the, um, in, the, in the middle. Part of the reason for that is an egg has to be a strong structure because there's somebody in there who's, um, who's, who's going to be a, a chicken. And uh, a, a chicken, <laughs> well, no, not these ones, <laughs> in, in, the, in the wild. So it has to be a, a, strong, uh, a, a strong housing. And one of the ways that it needs to be strong is, is pressure from, from end to end in the, uh, in the nest. Now, part of what you can also do, if, if that doesn't impress your, your mother and father, your aunts and your uncles enough, is, um, is you can... You can actually stand on eggs. Now we can't do this here because we haven't been able to, to we, we can't frame the, the camera like this. We, we, but if what you do is get yourself a couple of trays, put a, a book on top just to spread the load, Josh could stand on here and wouldn't break an egg. Come on, Josh. Up you go. Uh, do you want to go? you want me to have stand on? Have, sure. have a go. I'm not Absolutely. sure whether the... I don't know. I'm we may just, we may just get you. We may just get your feet. So stand on the this chair. It may not work. Stand on it. Well, uh, it's, it's oh, worked before. Maybe. Maybe. Well, up you go. All right. You get on top of Josh, too. And, uh, and you, you just we're stand just, on there. We're just zoomed in on the gonna, main parts oh, here. We just want to see oh, the feet. Oh, that cracked. Has some of them... Yeah, well, you, got, you need to try to get up there, too. Oh, oh, oh. Hey. Well, dearie me. Sometimes <laughs> I'll tell you what we really should have. Get the other one down there. We've got more. We've, yeah, we, what, what you need to do. It's very flimsy, too. It's a load bearing issue. Yeah, yeah. It, it, we've, we usually use actually we a styrofoam piece. Yeah. Um, and, Whose and telephone if you can, is that? If, if you, take this, you take this off, put it over there, and you spread the load across three of these, and you do it with something that's a bit firmer than, than the, uh, the phone book, a sheet of styrofoam is what we frequently used, you would find that you could, in fact, put an adult on the, on the, on the top there. Well, wow. <laughs> <That's amazing. laughs> the finger part of that worked, but, but this didn't. Now then, try, uh, try this. Um, Josh, you got some, uh, you got some yeah. bags there. And I'll get rid of this stuff down here. There's uh, one less egg for breakfast. This, the, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm an omelette tonight. <laughs> <laughs> He's cooking us supper. <laughs> so, uh, in my time at Science North, we do lots of different experiments with, uh, with visitors. And this is one of them. So, we've got a plastic lunch bag here. I'm going to fill it up with water. Kind of. Yeah. Go ahead. you got the staff to hold there it. Put some more water in. Put some more water in, Josh. You need some more water. You're going to step on that one too, are you, Josh? Yeah. <laughs> no more standing. 
Do you want any more water? No, we're good. Yeah, that, that'll, All right. that'll do. That'll do, that'll do. Now, Josh needs to hold us. All right. So now then, what um, what Steph is going to do is, is to take these very sharp, newly freshly sharpened pencils <laughs> and is going to do something with them that seems unbelievable. So where you go, Steph. <laughs> and there goes another one. Now, then, did you see a drop of water escape from that bag? No. No? No. 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 Nope. Well, this is an ordinary little sandwich bag that lots of kids take to, their lunch to school in, uh, straight out of the, 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 the box there. The reason this, and you have to do it with, um, with polyethylene um, uh, bags, uh, you can't do it with a plastic shopping bag, because what's happening here is that the heat that is, um, that is produced by the friction of the pencil passing through the, the polyethylene produces a little seal. Around the, around the pencil, which stops the water uh, flowing out. The reason you can't do it with a shopping bag is because the pencil tears the, the plastic. That's not what's happening here. The, the pencil is actually moving through the, the polyethylene, and there's a seal being created around it. A, um, I don't know how many molecules are involved, but it's certainly a very, very thin, thin foam. But it works. And there are other foams that are, that are important. Um, uh, that people know about too. The film that develops underneath, uh, underneath an ice skate or, the f or under underneath a, a, uh, right. a ski. We're surrounded by very, very small scale processes that, um, that don't catch our attention until you do something like, like this. So part of what uh, this, this little experiment will do is gather a crowd around you at Science North, or you could do it on the street and it would gather a crowd around you, or at a family <laughs> party, or in a pub. And, and you'd immediately have a, a, a stepping stone into talking about the science that's going on in, um, in that, um, that neat little demo. Now, what you're going to need to do, Josh, is <laughs> drop that in the, in the, in the bucket. Um, I well, uh, <laughs> before well, you take the pencils out. Okay. <laughs> hey, Colin, I'm wondering, did we just give you an idea for the uh, classroom to, uh, for a fun experiment or what? Oh, been there, done that, my friend. Oh, you've been done that done one already? Yes. It's, oh, th yes. This, yeah, but I think most <laughs> teachers probably know about uh, it's, know about this. It's a this. fun one, though. And yeah. it is, and and on one uh, on one on one goes with um, with the the, the, the book of, uh, of of little counterintuitive experiments. Now, what mm. what I'd like to do though, as we we come towards um, the uh, the end of, uh, of of your hour, is to shift to another technique that that's that's very important, and that is using objects. Uh, and again, it's, it's not something that's, uh, that's strange to teachers. And I want to just use some objects under a camera here that illustrate um, part of what's interesting about the science around Sudbury in, um, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the rocks. Before I show you the rocks, I want to show you some pictures because part of what we also stress is that pictures really are worth a thousand words. And, and we just did a, a, a class on that kind of, thing, um, kind of thing last week. So if Josh, you can go to the... Um, to the slides here. Part of Sudbury's history is, is this. About nearly two billion years ago, Sudbury was hit by, um, by a small asteroid. We often just call it a, a meteorite. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 kilometers across and traveling at what we call extraterrestrial speeds. So something like 25, even 30 kilometers a, a second. In other words, taking um, taking uh, only 10 seconds, 15 seconds to get from Sudbury to, to Toronto. So traveling at really, really high extraterrestrial speeds. The result of that is that um, today you will see if you look down from a satellite um, from about 500 kilometers, you would see a scar on the landscape around, um, around where Sudbury is that looks a bit like this. Now, you'll see very clearly the, um, the, the, the black water of, of the lake. That's Lake, lake Wanapate up near the airport uh, in Sudbury. And then stretching down uh, toward the, um, the left-hand side of the picture, you'll see a, a ridge of, of hills well marked on the uh, on the north side the upper side in the, in the photograph a little less well marked on the south side the lower side of the photograph with flat land in the in the middle what you're looking at there is you're looking at 
one of the two largest craters on the, the surface of the Earth. And if you want to see something equivalent in size, look up at the, the moon any time, especially though uh, around this time of year uh, or this, this particular year because the moon is, is extra close and the, the craters look extra, extra large. The, the Sudbury Basin, as we call it, is a, a moon-sized, a large moon-sized uh, crater. And Sudbury, the city of Sudbury, if we go back to the picture there, uh, there, Josh, can we go back to the last one? The city of Sudbury is a little white patch around the, um, the bottom of the, uh, the photograph that lies on the south side of, of what we call the, uh, the Sudbury Basin. Remember that there's been two billion years of erosion, of wearing away of the, the surface that's taken place since the impact of the, uh, of the meteorite. So when we, um, when we drive across the, the, uh, the basin now, it's, it's something like 35 kilometers across and it's about 65 kilometers long. It was originally about 200 kilometers across and it was originally circular, but it's been squeezed by mountain building forces in the last couple of billion years that have pushed from the direction of, uh, of, of, of southern Ontario. And, and there are people around who speak about northern Ontario having been pushed around by southern Ontario for um, <laughs> millennia, not just... Anyway, uh, next, one, next one, Josh. When, when you get out there and you look at the rocks, the rocks which correspond to the different colors on this geological map are arranged in a, in a, uh, a boat shape now, and it's because of that squeezing from the south that it's not... Uh, the Sudbury Basin isn't circular anymore. That, uh, that a, a geological map like this was what attracted the astronauts who were part of the Apollo program and the geologists who were training them back in the, uh, in the, 19, the late 1960s, early 1970s. The, um, the people who were training the astronauts were looking for a place on the Earth where they could go, where the astronauts would see rocks that were similar to those that are on the surface of the, um, of the, um, of the moon. And I'm not sure whether we can do this, but Brian, can we cut to, the, uh, to this little camera here? Are we able to do that? Or is that too, no, there we go. Oh, yeah, and and yeah. here we go with, um, with one of the rocks that, if you were to have a piece of moon rock that's from Sudbury, it's, um, it's one of the rocks that, that is in that boat-shaped arrangement of, uh, of, of uh, the geological map. And if you put a, a moon rock next to this, you wouldn't be able to visually tell the, the difference. All of these little pieces here, uh, there's a bigger one there, and all of these little gray pieces were part of the, the land into which the, the meteorite collided and was then th that, uh, that debris was thrown up in the air and fell back down again to become one of the rocks of the, um, of the, of the Sudbury Basin. Um, if we go back to the, uh, to the map, there, map there, Josh, the, the whole thing looks a little bit like a, a hard-boiled egg cut from end to, to end. And, and those, um, those fragments that we just looked at are part of the yellow, the yellow there. The purple layer on the outside, that purple ring, that dark purple ring, is one of the most important rocks in Canada. It's, um, it's the, the rock that was once molten in the bottom of the crater and out of which the, the ore of the Sudbury Basin separated. So if we can come back to the camera again there, uh, Brian. This is what you find when you walk around the edge of that, um, that ring of, of, of purple rock. And, and what you're looking at that's shining at you in a sort of a brassy kind of way is you're looking at the ore of the Sudbury Basin. You're looking at the nickel and the copper ore of the Sudbury Basin. And I can switch that specimen for this one, which is practically solid copper, copper sulfide. There's some, there's, uh, there's some worthwhile copper in this specimen. And, and here is one that is practically 100% nickel sulfide. The, the ore... Do you have any, Pardon? Do you have any gold? Uh, well, you know, there is gold, in, in, especially in here. There's always a little bit of gold along with the, the copper, but we need a lot in order to, 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 to get you $1,000 <laughs> worth of, uh, of, of gold. But indeed, uh, Sudbury uh, does produce gold. Sudbury pours about a brick of gold every, every week, I think. 
uh, at oh. least that's what it used to be um, about 15 years ago when we took a camera into the uh, into the operations and made a little movie of, of uh, Sudbury uh, Sudbury's gold gold bricks. Uh, so what you need to imagine then is is the crater that was produced by the the impact and uh, the impact having melted the the rock of the of the impact the impact site the bottom of the crater and into the um, into the bottom of the crater came molten rock from from underneath and it was the mixing of those two melts as we call them one from underneath and one within the crater that caused the the copper and the nickel and the gold and the silver and all of the other stuff that was part of the molten pool in the bottom of the crater that caused it to separate to separate out and that's why in in this specimen that you just looked at uh, the ore looks like like droplets it literally was droplets and if you were to put this back in the Sudbury Basin you can um, into the crater you can imagine the the droplets settling through the uh, the, the the molten rock and settling out to, to form a pool at the bottom of the crater, which is just solid metal, metal ore. So the, um, the, the two solid metal specimens sit underneath the, um, the, uh, the, the sort of spotted looking rock. And then right on top of all of that uh, is, the, is the, frozen, the frozen rock in the bottom of the crater that is just, just rock. And there are maybe 10 kilometers of, of this stuff, out of which just a few, a few hundred meters of, uh, of ore settled at the, the bottom. Process rather like oil and, and water separating, but this was metal and rock in the, in the, uh, the Sudbury Basin. A, a, very important, um, a very important story for, uh, for us that many of our researchers spend a lot of time on uh, at the moment, and also, the, of course, the, the, uh, the mining companies. Uh, so an important, important science story in, um, in, in Sudbury. And, and then, as if that wasn't enough, on top of all of, uh, of, of the, um, the goodies from the, from the Sudbury Basin come, comes the record of, of ancient seas, the, um, the so-called Paleozoic ancient, ancient life, seas with corals, Beautiful, quite beautiful corals, some small ones there and a, and a bigger one here, that flooded across the Sudbury area. We don't see it anymore, but we do find those rocks on, uh, on Manitoulin Island, which is one of the, um, one of the largest islands uh, in the world that's enclosed in a, in a lake uh, and is in the, um, the northern part of, of, of Lake, lake Huron. Uh, these are fossils that are about 450 million years old. They um, are part of a, a, the, the record of a sea that just about totally flooded across Canada. You can find fossils like, like that up in the Arctic. You can find them out in Manitoba. You find them especially down in, in southern Ontario where they're in the rocks of the, the Niagara Escarpment and, and Niagara, Niagara Falls. One of the times in the history of the Earth when the continents were, um, were flooded by, by shallow, shallow seas. And one of the big differences between then and now is that now a lot of the water of our, of our oceans is tied up in the ice sheets of the Arctic that Steph was talking about and the, uh, the Antarctic. We're living on a, a relatively cold planet and the sorts of shallow, warm seas that these corals lived in over what is now the central part of our continents, we don't have those anymore. Instead, we've got water tied up in, um, in, uh, in ice caps. So David, let me ask you those a, are the kinds of, of geological science stories that we tell in, um, in Sudbury. David, uh, let me sorry, ask guys. You a, a, a timing question. So you, you, we were talking about the, the basin, and you showed us the, the really great photographs of the basin, um, and then the corals. Now, the, the basin itself is 2 billion years old, um, That's right. and the corals you said are 450 million years old. They're 450 million years old. Yeah. So yes. And the, the coral is, is pretty common in Manitoulin. I mean, if you walk around the shores of Manitoulin yep. in the right spot, there, there's coral everywhere. Um, and you said there's no coral here in, in Sudbury, but we're only 60 miles away. So why are we not finding the corals here? And we are finding them there because it's obviously not the basin, because the basin is off by a million and a half, or a billion and a half years. So why the difference? 
Hey, Dr. The, Pearson, um, I think we'll that question the, the, when we the, come the back from a little break from our sponsors here. So sure. just hang on one second. got to get this in, and uh, it's been so interesting that I've uh, you know, let it lapse for about 40 minutes, but I do have to break for a couple minutes to do a sponsor spot. And when we come back, we'll hear the answer to Thomas's question. I do want to extend an appreciation to our sponsors out of Woodstock, Ontario, Mueller Systems. They are the makers of backup software and um, all things backup related. You know, just recently we had a situation gone wrong at my place where I thought that I was an incredible home plumber and put an extension on a pipe outside and the pipe backed up over the wintertime froze and my basement flooded. And wouldn't you know it, of course, um, I had two computers that were sitting on the concrete floor in the basement, and when I woke up in the morning, they had two inches of water in them. Um, boy, was I ever glad that I had an online service where my backup was being sent to the cloud on a regular basis. And I encourage our listeners, if you're out there and you are just backing up you know, locally or you're not backing up at all, you really don't have an effective backup until you actually send your information out to the cloud somewhere and, and uh, help prepare for catastrophes like in my house where I think that I can do it all. Evidently, I can't. Check out that website today at MuellerData.com slash VROC. That's M-U-L-L-E-R-D-A-T-A dot com slash V-R-O-C. You can try their software free for 90 days, and we encourage you to do so. Thank you very much for their support, and uh, back to the show. Dr. Pearson, sorry to rudely cut you off, uh, but uh, we're eagerly anticipating your answer to Thomas's question. Well, Thomas uh, is, is right in the unspoken assumption in his question that um, those rocks were once, once here. They once were in the Sudbury area, and there are one or two places where one can go and, and find pockets of them that, um, that, that still exist, just very quite small pockets that, that still exist. The, the reason that we don't see much of them anymore is that wind and weather has eroded them, has worn them away over Sudbury, and the reason that they're, they're left on, on, uh, in Manitoulin Island and on the Niagara Escarpment and, and down in, in Michigan is that that part of the Earth's crust, for reasons that we don't understand, has a, had a sag in it for about uh, 20 million years, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300 million years ago. And, uh, and if you can imagine the, uh, the Earth's crust sort of sagging and, and the, um, the old rocks with the, the corals in them um, becoming part of the, um, the basement, I shouldn't say basement in a geological sense. That uh, the, my, my geologist friends would would not want me to, to say that. But but those rocks with uh, with corals in became buried beneath younger rocks um, and were not eroded away because of that sag in the Earth's crust that is in fact centered over over Michigan. Um, and part of the reason that Lake Michigan has got the shape that it has, that kind of crescentic shape, is because it mimics. Uh, it follows the the um, the surface shape of of some of the layers that that form the edge of that that sag. So there's a there's, there's something quite odd about the um, about uh, the Earth's crust just over Michigan, which has led to that sinking and led to the the preservation of uh, of old rocks around the the um, around the margin of that that sag. Now, if we, we just continue quickly with the the, the slides. Um, can you just pr keep pressing there, Josh? We got to the map. Go beyond the, the map here. Here you, you'll see the, the thump. Uh, next one there, Josh. Move on. The thump of the, um, of the, the meteorite. There it is at um, something like its, its, uh, its full size, maybe a couple of hundred kilometers across. And there it is today. We just have a tiny little remnant of what was a much, a much larger, larger structure. There and the, um, in some of the hills around Sudbury are some of the rocks that were formed by the debris that fell back into the, the crater. And there you see the, the kind of rock out in the field uh, that I showed you under the, under the, the camera here, that what we call the fallback material, the fallback uh, debris that, that fell back into the, 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 the crater. Uh, some of the stuff that, um, the, some of the rock that was the molten pool in the, in the crater and here you see uh, on the next one, uh, you'll see some of the ore that we talked about separating out. Very, very important um, rocks uh, around Sudbury. And um, if we have a quick look at what comes next, this is what the, the land around Sudbury looked like 
oh, in the 1970s and just let them roll, Josh. This is what's happened to the landscape around Sudbury in the last um, 30 years. Uh, gradually, with the cutting down of the emissions from the smelter stacks, the, uh, the sulfur dioxide, the landscape has recovered, and we've planted now over 10 million, 10 million trees, which has changed the landscape around Sudbury. It's a reminder of the kind of damage that occurs from uh, mining and, and smelting activities, but it's also a reminder of the, uh, the kind of recovery that's possible when a community sets about uh, dealing with the, uh, dealing with the, the, uh, the issue. Um, and this is, again, part of the research that goes on at the university here in how best to, to restore the, uh, the landscape, not just in, in by putting trees back, but by increasing the, the biodiversity, the whole richness of of the, um, the ecosystem that was destroyed during the, uh, the very heavy industrial damage of, uh, of mining in the early part of David, this, could, uh, this century. If I could tie that back to a comment that we made earlier, um, Steph brought up the, the, the lichen. She had a picture of the lichen in the, in the, from her Arctic trip. Um, we, we had Franco Mariotti on the program uh, maybe a month ago now. We were chatting with, with Franco. Um, one of the things that was most exciting when I moved to Sudbury was, was walking around the Sudbury area with Franco, and he's been such a part of that regreening of Sudbury and, and gets so excited about it. We were walking behind my house in an area that's been very actively retreed, and he was excited about the trees, but he was really excited about the lichen. And the area is just covered now with three or four different species of lichen um, that have obviously moved in in the last 20, maybe 30 years. Um, but that was one of the things that he was getting excited about, this indicator, not just the trees are coming back, but the diversity of the, the, uh, the ecosystem itself, uh, and that, that being an indicator of, uh, that comes in slowly. So lichen aren't the first thing to come in and colonize. They're a late colonizer, or they're at least a slow colonizer. Uh, and he was so excited to see the right kind of lichen, lichen coming back. He might, Thomas, have been looking at um, what's called old man's beard. It's a, it's a hairy looking lichen that, that grows on the bark of, of trees. And it's particularly sensitive to, to sulfur dioxide. And when, uh, when I came to Sudbury three decades ago now, you couldn't find old man's beard anywhere. And, and I have a, a, a buddy, well, you know, you know Peter Beckett, um, another biologist at the, the university who's a specialist in, in lichen. And, and I was with him uh, about five years ago as we walked around and, um, part of the campus here, and he found old man's beard growing on a on, on a tree. The first one that he'd seen this close to the to the smelters, and, and I still remember Peter's Peter's delight. So lichen are indicators. You're right; they're very very important environmental indicators, and uh, and that old man's beard is is one of the most famous around um, around Sudbury. I do want to give uh, Colin a chance to uh, jump in here. It's, it's been an unusual <laughs> show today, but I think it's been very educational, mm -hmm. very interesting. Uh, Colin, I'm interested in your comments or, uh, or questions for our distinguished panelists today. Well, you know, it's, it's really cool, and it, it's exciting to hear that this sort of a, you know, the, the program that, that um, the students are in exists. And I, I can't help but sort of I have a question. I'm going to preface it by, by a comment, first of all. Um, and, and that is thinking about science communication in mass media, right, and, and how poor it's sometimes done. I'm thinking about last week's big announcements of life found in a meteorite that turned out to be junk science and was widely reported by the mass media. And then good stories came out from places like Nature and, and, and NASA themselves. But those don't make the, the front page of, you know, Fox News and that sort of thing. So as you folks go forward in your career, what kind of impact does, does this sort of mass media junk science reporting have on you as you, as you think about you know, doing good reporting and good communication moving forward? Well, I can tell you that it's discouraging to, to read that, um, <laughs> that junk science. And, and part of the reason that uh, I come across quite a lot of it is that uh, one of the science hats that I, that I wear is a, a climate, change, climate change hat. So I do spend uh, quite a lot of time having to, to read some of the, um, uh, the unscientific um, blogs, I guess, is where they, most of this information uh, appears. But I, I, I do have to read a, a lot of that stuff. It, it is discouraging. Um, and part of the reason it's, it's discouraging is that at the same time as the, the blogosphere is, is allowing those with with opinions that are not based on science to get a, a lot of what you might call airtime readership, 
is that uh, newspapers are cutting back on the, the number of science, science reporters that they, that they have. Absolutely. And in fact, tomorrow in, in London, and, and right here on campus through a guest that we're bringing in from, um, from, from Ottawa, by coincidence, simultaneously, we'll be talking about this, this issue of, um, mm. of the, uh, the, the decrease in the, the number of science-qualified reporters who right. are not just reporting for, for the, uh, the TV stations, but also in newspapers and magazines and so forth. Yeah. It's a very, very important and, and discouraging uh, issue. If, um, if, if we, we take anything uh, away from it that's, that's positive, it is that people with determination can, in fact, make a, make a difference if they, they know how to, to communicate in, in effective, effective ways. And they use places like science centers, they, um, they, they use magazines, they use television when they can, they can get there with their, their, their stories of their own, their own experiences. There's a, there's a vacuum being created and, and um, we're pleased at the thought that our students can, can fill it, but it is a very discouraging situation, I must say. I have a let, uh, question for a, uh, your graduate uh, students, actually, if I may. Sorry, Thomas. Um, Steph and uh, Josh, when I look at you, I see that you're not much older than some of the students who are now wrestling with career decisions, uh, you know, grade 12 and uh, high school, maybe grade 11. And um, maybe you could just talk a little bit about how you got to be where you are today and what inspired you to get there um, and, and maybe give some direction to some of those students on how they can achieve careers in sciences. Uh, well, I, uh, I actually started at Science North when I was in grade nine. I started off as a volunteer there. So even things you do in high school uh, can lead to, to nice. opportunities in the future. Uh, I was a volunteer at Science North and I was hired in grade 10 and I've been there ever since. Uh, wow. And through there I, I learned about this program and, uh, and also around campus saw the posters. And, uh, and so just keep an eye open for opportunities around you. They're, they're always there and you, you might not be looking in the right place, but they're, they're there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, uh, I never thought about this sort of thing, and then I had a job right after I graduated from university at a zoo, and they just sort of threw me on stage and were like, give this presentation on animals to these kids, and I'd never <laughs> done anything like it, and I was so nervous, and I ended up loving it, and my parents came and watched, and they were like, wow, like, you should really do something with this. So it's just take any, like Josh said, like take any opportunities you can, because even if it's out of your comfort zone, it might be your new passion, like it might be something that really suits you. And um, same with writing, I love writing, and this program is very focused on good, effective writing. And so it's sort of something I was looking for, and I came across this program, and I was like, this is perfect. This is exactly what I was looking for. So. <laughs> and uh, next thing you knew, open. you were on a ship in the Northwest Passage in the Arctic. So uh, exactly. that's, that's wonderful. Sorry, Thomas, to cut you off. You had a question for uh, one of our panelists? Oh, no, that was perfect. It, well, a comment and a, and a, a question. Um, we were talking about the, 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 the current downsizing in science journalism. Um, just to, to give a plug for a show that we'll have in May, uh, Wendy Williams is an author. She just published a book called Kraken on uh, giant squid. Um, and I met her through my mom and a bookstore connection. Um, it's a really exciting book. It'll be a lot of fun. I th I, you guys will get a copy to, to read. Uh, she has a background in science journalism, and I was talking to her last year about how she was able to write this book that has just really fantastic science. It's one of the best pop sci books I've read. And her comment was that she has that education because her editor, when she was a science journalist on Cape Cod, which is not a huge market, um, her editor kept sending her to places like Woods Hole and the Marine Bio Bio Biology Lab um, to get an education. And these are the kind of resources that are not necessarily available now. And, and this is one thing that she was lamenting. Not only are the number of, sci of science journalists decreasing, but having this opportunity for an editor to, to push her to go out and expand her education uh, made her a fantastic journalist and has also made her a really good author. Um, so that's sort of a downside. But on, on a positive side, just to talk a little bit about this program. So I have master's students now that are finishing up. And for the entire time that they have been students, this science communication program has been around, and there's a lot of interaction between the science communication students and the graduate students. Um, there's a lot of direct interaction where they're out and socializing together, they're talking together, they're working together on, on presentations, and there's a lot of indirect interactions where when my students present, at least locally on campus, they're being critiqued by David's students. So we really have a neat opportunity here at Laurentian, a relatively small school, but having this really unique program, my students, my uh, 
science master's students are better communicators for having worked with and worked around the science communication students. So that's certainly something that, that we've seen as improvement here on campus. Um, not only is, is David's program training really good science communicators, but they're indirectly training the rest of our students to be better communicators at the same time. And that's been a lot of fun to watch. Well, thank you for that, uh, Thomas, if, if, if I may comment right away. And, and, you know, maybe that's one of the ways that we can combat this, uh, the, this deflation of the quality of, of science journalism by improving the ability of scientists themselves to, to, talk, about, um, to talk about what they do. So, com so increasing the communication strength of the, the, the science community to in some way compensate for, uh, for the for the, the diminution of the, the standards and number of, uh, of, of science, uh, science journalists. Uh, but I'm really, really pleased to, to hear you say, which you've said in the corridor too, um, that, um, that, that's what's, that that's one of the benefits that come into, come into your students. It, it's absolutely true. And, and I think the, the point that you just made is a very good one. Science is, is incredibly competitive. Um, and my impression talking to the people who have been in the field longer than I have is that it, it's becoming more and more competitive, not less and less competitive. And you have to be a very good scientist, but if you're not a very good communicator, you will not be successful in today's science. You will not get money. You will not get things published. Um, publishing is, is not the bottom line. It's publishing and having that material read, publishing in such a way that people are reading it, people that you're convincing people to fund your research. And that goes hand in hand with our responsibility to get this information out to the public. If I do really good science and nobody knows, then I've wasted everybody's money. So I have a responsibility as somebody who is using taxpayer money to do research, not just to do that research to the best of my ability, but also to communicate that. And I have a responsibility to my own lab and my career to keep that going. And I will have a better career if I'm a better, better communicator. I'll do a better job of getting my science out to the, to the public if I'm a better communicator. And I think that, that many of today's working scientists are realizing that this is the case, that they can't just sit back in their office. If they want to continue to be successful scientists, they have to communicate that. And so I think there's more and more a push for people to, to interact with groups like David's, with students like David's producing, um, if nothing else, just for our own survival. You can't do science without being a good science communicator. And so having programs like this will help all of us in science keep doing science longer. Steph, Josh, you, you've got thoughts about uh, how much communication came to you when you were in your undergraduate programs? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say, the way I found out about this program was another point for people watching is talk to people because I was just telling friends, anyone that would listen, like, this is kind of what I want to do. I want to talk to people, but I don't know how or what. And then I came across a girl who was part of my undergrad who took the this course last year and part of my argument to people when I was telling them these things was that I learned so much cool stuff in undergrad stuff that I just loved and I wanted everyone to know about and I, my mom loves it when I say did you know because she knows I'm gonna tell her something really cool right after yeah. um, and it's stuff <laughs> that I had to dig through journal articles for hours to find out or a professor had to tell me and I who reads journal articles in the general public you know, like it's not a big thing. People aren't sitting around looking through science or nature, but we do do that. And so we need to get it out there so that people can understand what's going on in the world and hear all these cool things that they don't get a chance to, to read about or hear about. So that was part of my motivation was just to get the things that I found so cool out to everyone else without having to tell everyone individually. <laughs> And, and when you we, drive um, past the parking lot of, of Science North and, and see it full of full of cars, you know that people are are interested in science. It, it's not that um, it's not that people are are turning their curiosity to, to something else. It's it's not that uh, that science is uh, is not as as uh, accessible or as um, as arousing and stimulating as it as it used to be. But the parking lots of science museums and science centres are, are always uh, always full. And, and Josh, you you know that what it's like at Science North when you've got 2,000 people in, yeah. a, in an afternoon <laughs> crawling through the place, uh, all of them interested. Uh, that was last week. It was March break at Science North and 2,000 <laughs> interested people every day coming through asking questions, uh, talking about all sorts of different topics. Uh, and 
and it's uh, it's difficult in un in your undergrad in science. You don't always get it, uh, an opportunity to practice the communication aspect. Uh, I did one presentation in my undergrad, and it wasn't in a science course. So uh, so it's great to have an opportunity like this as well. Uh, so you you learn a, you pick up a lot of great stuff in in science courses, uh, a lot of great knowledge. But then to learn to communicate it, you. Uh, you have to do that, learn that somewhere else, it seems. So it's, it's great that we have this at Laurentian. Mm -hmm. Dr. Yeah. Pearson, uh, Josh, and, and Stefan, uh, literally the minute that we have left, please tell uh, the listening audience where they can go to find out some more information about you and your research. www.sciencecommunication.ca. And uh, there you will find uh, the students are blogging, and you will find uh, an account of our last field trip down to the Perimeter Institute and the Discovery Channel and the Ontario Science Centre and the Royal Ontario Museum. Sciencecommunication.ca, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Super. Well, on behalf of Dr. Thomas Merritt from Laurentian University and Colin Jago from the Kawartha Pioneers District School Board, I'd like to thank each of you for coming on the show today. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, to, to come on the show and talk about what you are and what you do and uh, to inspire those students out there to enter science as a career choice. Thank you very much for coming on the show today. Thanks, Thanks folks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Buddy, that'll do it for another show of This Week in Science and Education. Tune in again next week, same time, same place, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Take care, everyone.